Amen. Amen. Good morning, church. Oh, man. Can we say thank you to our amazing worship team? Can we say thank you to David for leading us in communion this morning? Oh, man. You show up to a coffee house church, you get taken to the throne room. My goodness. <laughs> You know, earlier on, you saw that video with a recap from camp, and there was a moment in the video where you saw where a bunch of students who um, are seem to be, like, held together by ropes and are being, like, swung around into trash cans. Um, they're, they're plastic trash cans, but uh, it is, in my opinion, one of the most violent, vicious, safest, controlled games you could ever let your child play. <laughs> It's also the game, it's called Kajabi Can Can. It's also the game where every year, uh, whenever the name is brought up at camp, you have this divide in the room. You have those who are just sold out warriors for Kajabi that are just like, yeah, so excited. And then you have the complete opposite. They're like, oh, this again. <laughs> but for whatever reason this year, everyone seemed bought in on this game. We did it at night. We did a whole tournament style thing for it. And I was the host of it, and you understand my extremely calm demeanor, very controlled, no at all sense of competitiveness or anything like that at all. Well, for whatever reason, some like switch flipped, and I blacked out, and I swear like William Wallace showed up or something. <laughs> there was a moment where I walked out there. And I have this giant megaphone attached at my hip that I barely knew how to use, and I'm yelling into it, and I'm screaming, and then there's this moment where all the guys are doing their round of Kajabi. They're all holding these ropes, going around these cans, and I'm yelling, um, if you ask your leaders, your male leaders, what the best moments in their life will be, they will tell you it is the moment their children are born, it is the moment that they got married. Years from now, when people ask you what the best day of your life will be, you will say it is when you won Kajabi Can Can 2024. <laughs> and I couldn't be more wrong. <laughs> but there was a moment where I said that, and some guy, his name's, um, oh, man, what is, what's his name? It's, uh, it starts with a D, uh, and it's a very, like, strange, it's like, uh, dare, I think it's um, Devlin. Yeah, Devlin looks at me. And as I said this, he looks at me and he goes, yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, no. Uh, and I was never more scared of a high school student in my entire life than in that moment where I locked eyes with Devlin and thought, this boy's going to murder me. Um, <laughs> um, but after Kajabi Can Can ended, all the students, they took a knee. And I got to share with them. And I said, you know, we joke around about this being the best moment of our life. But really, the best moment of your life most likely took place about an hour ago where several of you committed your lives to Jesus for the first time. And following that time of competition, those students went into their cabins and got to have conversations with their leaders all about uh, praying over one another and diving into this idea of what does it mean now to have a relationship with Jesus. It's why we do camp, um, not for the competition, um, but for the, uh, for the congregation that those students get to step into, fellowship with Christ. Um, and so it's, it's a really great privilege to be a part of and something I'm really looking forward to uh, later on this month with our junior high students as well. Um, th this morning, uh, we're going to be borrowing from uh, Scott's words. Uh, we're taking an exodus from Exodus. Um, we're going to be diving a little bit further into history. We're going into the New Testament, Colossians 3, 1 through 17. Um, our, our leadership team um, for the past several months, years and decades, I don't know, it's been a long time. We've been reading this book called Awe by Paul David Tripp. And in chapter 11 of that book, um, it's titled The Church. And he quotes Colossians 3, um, a portion of 1 through 17 in that chapter. And ever since I read that, it has been stuck on my mind. <laughs> it's like a song you just can't get out of your head. It's been Colossians 3, 1 through 17, over and over and over again. And so consider this talk a like passion project to get a song called Colossians 3 out of my head. <laughs> but... Let's read through that together and, and see what the Lord has for us. Colossians 3, 1 through 17, it says this, If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. 
Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these things, the wrath of God is coming. In these you too once walked when you were living in them. But now you must put them all away, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave-free, but Christ is all and in all. Put on then, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Yes and amen. It's a good song to get stuck in your head. The first point I want to share with you is this. It is where your heart is. It comes from Colossians 3, 1 and 2, where Paul writes, If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is. Seated at the right hand of God, set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. Where your heart is, there your treasure will be also. There's two commandments that are given in Colossians 3, 1 and 2. It's, the first one is seek things that are above. And it's interesting because seeking after things or chasing after things, pursuing such things. In the NIV, it says set your heart on things that are above. What you seek is what you are passionate for. What you chase after is what you desire. It's saying, desire these things. So the first command is to desire that which is above, desire Christ. The first commandment. Jesus puts it this way in Matthew 6, 19 through 21. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Uh, we have to set our minds and our hearts on Christ, because when we start caring about what it is that we're storing for ourselves in heaven, we care a lot less about what it is we store for ourselves here on earth. And here's why that's important. When I am stressed about what's going on here on earth, it's because it's great reaching my heart because my heart is here on earth. But if my heart is present with Christ in heaven, then the things that stress me out here on earth aren't reaching my heart. I'm not that stressed. When I am fixated on Christ in heaven, the things that are beside me here on earth tend to make less sense because I care much more about the things that I set my heart on. And so the stress the anxiety, the things that eat away at me here make much less of an impact when I don't even consider myself present here because I place my heart with Christ in heaven. I focus on things above. Second thing with this is there your thoughts will be also. This is important. This is the second command that's given in Colossians 3, 1 and 2. It's set your mind on things that are above. So not only do we desire the things that are above, not only do we place our heart on the things that are above, but now our mind is fixated on the things that are above. Our mind is fixated on Christ. Where our heart is, there our thoughts will be also. We can no longer focus on ourselves. We must focus on Christ. We see messages everywhere that tell us to find our inner peace. We see messages everywhere that tell us to focus on ourselves. 
uh, that our own well-being is the most important thing. Uh, Self-enlightenment, knowing your body. You do you. This, uh, this was an argument I had recently, a couple weeks ago, um, where someone came in and uh, they were just like, man, I, I hear the, this you do you concept. And I know that a lot of the guys that are in part of the Friday morning men's group have probably heard Scott rant about this a couple of times. Um, definitely check out Friday morning men's group, 6 a.m. It's great. Um, little advertisement there. But this you do you concept, it means one of two things. And the conversation I remember having was it either means um, I'm going to do whatever I want to do and you can't stop me because whatever I'm doing is more important to me than you are. Or you do whatever you want to do because you're annoying me and I'd like you to leave me alone. <laughs> you do you as long as it isn't harming anyone else. As long as you aren't forcing your ideas on someone else because it's all your own and for yourself and your truth and your body, your choice, your life, your freedom, your pronouns, your needs, you and you and you and you and me and me and me and me. And the one thing that you and I can never be is us. The one thing that as long as it is I or as long as it is you, the one thing we can never be is united. It's dangerous. And to be fair, caring about your mental health, caring about your uh, bodily health, making sure that you take, have self-care in your life, these are good things. But when you become the center of your own universe, they become pretty dangerous things because you start worshiping such things. When you start worshiping your mental health, your enlightenment, when you start worshiping your body, when you start worshiping your self-care, suddenly the sole focus on yourself ultimately will harm that mental health, ultimately will harm your bodily health. Selfishness can become self-harmfulness. This happens in the church. Um, I, I know this, it, it happens through me. I, was, I wasn't um, the bright-eyed and bushy-tailed guy that I am today. I remember I interned for a large church um, not that them being large was the issue. My, my heart at the time was the issue. I had this conviction that everything that I accomplished in ministry had to be out of my own effort. It was naive, and it was wrong. Um, I remember sitting in meetings with pastors who would tell me, Davey, you really need to buy in on this thing that you're doing and everything that you're going to put into it. And if you could just give us an extra 20 hours a week, um, or 50, <laughs> whatever it would be, um, you would be able to write down on a resume one day that you did this and people would be really bought in on you. And so do the thing. And there's a sense of manipulation there, but there was also a sense of where my heart was at. I was absolutely bought into this. And if it wasn't something that I could put on a resume, it wasn't something that I cared for. I cared more about my measured effectiveness in ministry than, I, than the people that I ministered to. I could present numbers of people who were baptized or numbers of people that raised their hands or who attended an event that I made up, and I felt the pressure of a necessity to succeed by being impressive. It was wrong. I made mistakes, and I was hurting. God humbled me. I'm, I'm really grateful that he did. And, and let me encourage you that ministry is not something that's measured by your effectiveness. Uh, in fact, I think effectiveness is really poorly defined, um, especially within the church. Um, I, if I were defi to define effectiveness today, I would say effectiveness is our submission to God's effect on us, not what it is that we do. We submit to God, and it is God who affects the heart. Ministry is measurable, therefore, by our submission to God, not our impact on the world. Statistics show us today that the more self-aware we become, the more self-centered we become, the more self-focused we become, the greater our anxiety, depression, and self-loathing increases. It's almost as if um, we are depraved and in need of a savior, and the more that we look inward, the more depravity we see. Uh, the more we look inward, the more we're finding ourselves in greater hopelessness, and so we feel hopeless. The greater we look inward, the less hope that we feel because suddenly we see void and all that there is is void. 
Some of us think then that we need to just turn our brain off and stop searching. We start self-medicating. The problem with that is the person who's no longer concerned for themselves is a greater danger to themselves. The next step then is to focus on others. And this can be promising because we can care for others. We focus on our neighbors, at least the ones that we like. <laughs> we focus on our coworkers, at least the ones that we can stand. We definitely don't focus on our boss or our managers because those guys are jerks. We focus on our politics. We focus on our tribe. We focus on our people. And we get plugged into whatever community that we could possibly be plugged into, and we say, well, these are the other people because they're like me. And suddenly it's not about the other people. It's just about me getting bigger. We tell each other that we should focus on others. But the problem is, what if we don't like the other people that we are focusing on? What if we don't know how to help them? Imagine I want to help my neighbor, and I go up to him and I say, how can I help you? And they say, oh, uh, I would really like it if you could trim my palm trees. And I go, I have no idea how to trim your palm trees, dude. Good luck. And now I'm just some weird dude that asked to help them and didn't do a thing. <laughs> and if I put my self-worth in the people that I'm helping, then suddenly they're letting me down. If I put my self-worth in the people that I care about, then they're using me up. Give us 10 more hours, and it'll look good on your resume. It's going to happen in the church. Well, if you could just show up one more time to this, or if you could just help me out this one last time, or if you could just, and suddenly we start loathing the people that we help because they seem to be using us. And now my worth is found in the people that I'm helping, but I don't like anybody that I'm helping because every time I help somebody, it's self-fulfilling prophecy to know that they're just using me. And I'm being let down again and again and again because when I place my trust in other people, I'm bound to be let down. There's a problem when we are just looking for gold stars on our afterlife report card. The only person that we can focus our minds on then and our thoughts on must be Christ because then our hearts are set upon Christ and our hearts therefore reflect Christ to others. The person I don't know how to help, suddenly I know what it is that the greatest help that they could ever need and that's Jesus. The person that I don't care about helping, suddenly I do care because I know that they're made in the image of God and if God has made me, he has made them and I know that they are valuable and worth something even if I don't like them, even if they decide to mow their lawn at five in the morning. I care because I know Jesus cared for me. When we look to Jesus, we see the worth of our neighbor because we see them as made in the image of God. If our heart belongs to Jesus, so should our mind and so will our actions. The third point here is there your theology will be also. Where your heart is, your theology will be also. Our heart is already linked to what it is that we focus our deepest desires. Do we desire heaven or earth? Uh, do we desire Christ or do we desire more of ourselves? It, it impacts how we read scripture. If I'm reading scripture hoping to read for me and not read from God to me, then suddenly I'm okay putting something away and accepting something else. Suddenly I'm okay putting aside what scripture really is and just taking them at its words and just seeing it as only words. It becomes dangerous because if my heart is not fixated on Christ, then I open up this word and I say to myself, this is me talking to myself. Or if I am focused on Christ, I open up this word and I say, this is God having a conversation with me. And I will start listening a little bit more I will start caring a little bit more. I will start accepting a little bit more. I'll start believing a little bit more because my heart is not put in me. My heart is put in him, and this is what he's written for me. Do we root our understanding of God in God or in ourselves? When something doesn't sit right with us, is it we who determine truth or is it God? Do we seek to understand truth so that we're made to be correct? 
or do we seek to know truth so that we could even be corrected? Seeking a theology above by placing our hearts with Christ needs to include these three things, super important things. I'll go through them rapidly. The first is a belief in Jesus. The second is a life with Jesus. And the third is glory to God. You cannot just step into forming your opinions and ideas of who God is if you don't believe in him first. You got to believe in the Jesus of Scripture. You got to know who Jesus is. You got to know him so that you can understand him. You got to know him so you can understand him. You got to live with him so that you know who it is that you're understanding. So it's believing in Jesus, it's living life with Jesus, and then it's giving glory to God because when you get to those moments where you go, do I choose myself or do I choose what God has to say in Scripture? If I'm giving glory to God, I'm going to choose him every time. So I believe in him, I do life with him, and I will choose him above myself. I give him glory. Second main point is put to death. Because if we're starting to put our heart where Christ is and fixate our minds on where Jesus is, suddenly we're told that we are dead and it is the life of Christ that now lives in us. So what is it that we put to death? It comes from Colossians 3, verses 3 through 4. It says, For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. We put to death. That passage makes it super clear that it's the life that I live now is not my life. The life that I live now is the life of Christ. He is my life. He is the life that I have. My life has ended. I died. But Jesus is the life that I have today. Uh, B.B. Warfield um, wrote in in a sermon called The Hidden Life, Um, on Colossians 3, verses 3 and 4. He said, This life of ours is a hidden life, hid with Christ in God. God, not the world, is the sphere in which this life is passed. Christ is life itself, and Christ is now with God. The Christian in seeking heavenly things must not seek to be known of the world to be good, but only to be seen of God. If the old life that we once lived is now dead and gone and the new life we now live is Christ's life, then we are no longer to live for ourselves because we are dead. Instead, we live for Christ because he is alive and our life is his given to us. Continuing in Colossians verses 5 through 11, put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry, On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these, you too once walked when you were living in them. But now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. Three things that it is that we need to put to death. The first is an earthly way of living. Our actions need to reflect the life that we now live in Christ. But who are we reflecting our actions to? If we believe what B.B. Warfield was saying, then the sphere that we live our life in is within God, not within this world. The sphere that we live our life within is a life that is lived in the vision of God, in God seeing us, not the world looking to us, which means everything that we're living for is for him. Surely we are seen by the world, but our actions are not for the world, they're for Christ. If they were actions that were for the world, then our hearts would not be seeking Christ and treasures in heaven and the things above, but instead would still be stuck here on the things below. We need to be reflecting Christ back to Christ. Paul is telling us that we need to live in a way that reflects where our heart is. And if our heart is seeking Christ, so should our actions. Romans chapter 6, 1 through 6, Paul expands this idea. He says, what shall we say then? 
Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. We are no longer slaves. We are free because of what Christ has done for us on the cross. We are free from sin. Why would we ever want to live a life that is of slavery now that we have tasted the freedom that we have in Christ? A life lived in sin while you are free is a life that is choosing slavery over freedom. If my heart belongs to him, so do my actions belong to him. Christ is all and in all. By the way, this is, um, this is one of the, my favorite arguments against um, two, two polar opposites, um, two extremes that are both dangerous. One, legalism. The other, sinful liberty. If all our actions are of and for Christ, then there is nothing that we do that is of and for ourselves. So doing good in this life does no good for your old life. That would be argument against legalism. Uh, legalism is doing good things in hopes that your old dead self will be known as a good person. Uh, newsflash, dead people don't do things. So instead, all the good that we do is in Christ, of Christ, and for Christ, because our new life is his life. It is his good, and it is our joy, because his good is the greatest good that we could ever participate in. It is the greatest joy that we could ever feel. It is the greatest passion that we could ever be a part of. It is the greatest commitment we could ever commit ourselves to. It is the greatest relationship that we could ever be present in. And it is the greatest joy, happiness, everything, peace. It is the greatest all. Because it is Christ. Sinful liberty, are we then free to sin? By no means, Paul says. Our freedom is not to live as if we were never free to begin with. Our freedom is not to sin. Our freedom is from sin. Second concept here is we have to put to death an earthly way of speaking. And this one can be a harder one. Uh, this is this is the one where uh, it seems like there's a lot of times where it feels like I can't I can't stop what I have I can't take control of my mouth I, I'll have the argument and I'll say something I don't mean and I'll 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 I'll, I'll fester and I'll wrestle with something and then I'll just let it out and I really just tear someone else down it it can be a hard thing. Here's an encouragement for you from James chapter 3, verse 8. It says, but no human being can tame the tongue. So there you go. You you can't do it. Congratulations. You've learned. We, We can't do it. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With it, we bless our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. Our speech, it carries a great power. It's not by our own work, James says, that we could ever tame it. So instead fixating our hearts and our minds on heaven above, fixating our hearts and minds and our commitments to Christ on Christ and Christ alone, then it is only by the work of Christ that we could ever take the words of Paul in Colossians 3, verses 8 and 10. But now you must put them all away, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you've put off the old self with its practices have put on the new self which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. It is true that we could never tame the tongue, but that person who could never tame the tongue is dead. We now live in Christ. And he did. He did the work. And he's empowered us to do something that's great, which is to build each other up in love. Ephesians 4, 29, Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion, so that it may give grace to those who hear. That doesn't sound like a corrupt tongue. That sounds like something that 
is edifying for all to hear. What we state is either made in support of our creator or in opposition to our creator. Without Christ, all we can do is oppose, but in Christ, we are empowered to praise. This isn't a sermon on how you need to be careful what comes out of your mouth and stub your toe (laughs) or when uh, Dak Prescott throws an interception. (laughs) I can say that because Scott's not here. (laughs) This is about what you have to say to your fellow human beings who are made in the image of God about people who are as valuable as you are. Whether they are saved or not, they are made in his image and they have inherent value. We have to be careful about how we tear other people down. Whether they agree with us or disagree, whether they have strong opinions that are completely opposite to our own, we can disagree with people. We can have convictions. But the moment my convictions turn into hateful speech towards another person, I've lost myself to my convictions and I've lost myself from Christ. I need to pour into who Jesus is because he will be more important than my convictions are. Genesis 1, 26 and 27. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth. So and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Creepy. Sorry, intrusive thoughts alarm. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Man, people matter. And they don't matter because they say they matter. They matter because God says they matter. I I can walk in front of a group of people and say, I'm very important. And I'd hope you just, you know, brush that aside. But the moment God says, I made you and you are important to me, I'm going to take God at his word and say, yeah, that person's important. We, we have to be careful how we tear other people down. We have to be careful not to. Because when we tear someone else down, we're not just tearing down the person. We're tearing down the creation of God. We're tearing down the words of God that have said that that person is inherently valuable. We have teared down the commandment of God to have value over human life. When you attack a person, you're not just attacking the person, you are attacking the word of God. Because he spoke that over every human being and said, you are worth something. Third thing that we need to um, put to death is an earthly way of identifying. Colossians 3, starting in verse 9, it says, Do not lie to one another, seeing that you put off the old self with its practices, you put on the new self, which is being renewed, in knowledge, after the image of its creator. Here there is not Greek and Jew. This is the unifier. There is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. Put off the old self. Put on the new self. Can I encourage you that you are new? That you are not trapped by the things that have held you back before? That if you are in Christ, he has freed you from sin. We are no longer slaves. Why live in slavery today if you are free in Christ? You are being renewed in knowledge, meaning that you are growing more like Christ. And in him, we no longer identify apart from one another. But we are now unified in Christ as one body because he is all and in all of us who know and belong to him. This is how I know that we can succeed in putting to death our selfish actions and our self-centered speech. Because we no longer need to identify with ourselves. We belong to Jesus. I no longer look within me and see nothing. I no longer look within me and see depravity and despair. I no longer look within me and see hopelessness. I no longer look within me and see a void that is endless. I look within me and do I know Christ Should I know him and belong to him? Then I look within me and I see him alive within me. I no longer look within me and see death. I look within me and I see life because it is the life of Christ within me. You are new. You are alive. No longer dead, no longer condemned. I look within and should I belong to him, I see him alive in me. And then I know hope. And I know grace. I know mercy and I know forgiveness because I know Christ and he is in me. 
I don't look within to find myself anymore. I look to Christ, and in him I know who I am. Might I encourage you that you are not a sinner and no longer need identify as one because a sinner is someone who is known by their sin. You are known by Christ. Christian, little Christ. Your identity is not found in you. It is found in him. Stop looking within yourself to find out who you are and start looking to Jesus. He'll tell you who you are. And I would trust him much more because I can look at another person and tell them that they're awful. But I can look at God and he'll tell me that everyone has value. I can look at myself and say that I'm awful. But when I look to God, he says that I have value. I can lie to myself, but God will never lie to me. Why would I trust my own identity when I can trust him? He is much greater than I am. Hallelujah, oh, what a Savior. This encouragement extends far beyond just the negative identities that we hold. Because, I mean, we can look to Jesus, and if we belong to him, we can say, I'm no longer a sinner. We can say, I'm no longer a failure. I'm not a disappointment. I'm not broken. I'm not alone. But it's more than that. Our identity in Christ sur supersedes even the great things that are in our life. I'm no longer just my job or my successes. I'm no longer my wealth. I'm no longer my friendships. I'm not even my family. I'm not even my friends. I'm not even my identity is greater than the greatest good because my identity is in Christ. I am redeemed. I am forgiven. I am loved. I am new. I am whole. I am saved. I am a child of God. I am not my own. I am Christ's. Think of the greatest thing you could ever be and replace it with Jesus. His, he's much greater. And the third major point um, that we'll unpack, because if we're putting to death the things of our old life, we're making room then for the things of our new life and make room. It's, uh, the second half of this passage, Colossians 3, 12 through 17, it says, Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Make room. Why do old things in our life need to die so we can make room for new things? Why can't we just move new stuff in? Why can't it just be crowded? I had a roommate in college. We'll call him Kyle because that's his name. Uh, he w it's funny. I paused for a second uh, after this next sentence. I said he was terrible, and then I paused, and I meant to finish the sentence, but everyone just took it as I said he was terrible. And there was just this moment of, <gasps> he was terrible. He's not terrible. He was terrible at convincing a girl to like him. He'd exaggerate, and he would try to be impressive. Then he'd try to get me to help him out and be a good wingman. <laughs> but if I'm being honest with you, I didn't want to be a good wingman for two reasons. Um, one good reason, one bad reason, and I'll, I'll tell you both. The first was I didn't want to help Kyle because I hoped that he'd learn that he didn't need to be anyone other than himself in order to convince the right someone that he was worth the conversation. The second reason was when I messed up his chances of a second date, I thought it was hilarious. In this case, I was a terrible wingman. <laughs> and because of that, I was also considered a bad roommate. I don't think he, uh, on the roommate survey that comes at the end of the year, I don't think he checked it and said, next year, Davey. <laughs> but when our RA showed up one night to let us know that Kyle was suicidal, that he had told one of his professors that day that he was going to end his life, I'd like to think that my response of sitting with him, hearing his story, sharing the word with him and praying over him, 
were the marks of a good roommate. You see, my hope is that the things in us that we're putting to death become things that when the opportunity presents themselves to do those things again, we become really bad at them. Because those things are dead in us and we're not very good at it anymore. But the things that we have given life when those opportunities present themselves, that we would be great successes at pursuing the things that we've chosen to give life in our life, the things that are of Christ. I, I, would, I would so much rather be a failure by the world's standards when presented with the opportunities of the things that I've put to death to try and give them life once more than to be a failure by Christ's standards by having put to death something that I should have given life, something that I should have made room for. I would love to be a success by Christ's standards. If your roommate was Jesus, what kind of things in your life would he be excited to see moved out? What kind of things in your life would he be excited to see moved in? Make room. We have a list of things to get through that we're going to be making room for in our lives, and I'll get through it fairly quickly. Make room for virtue. Uh, when, when we're first given this list in Colossians 3, verse 5, there's a list of awful vices that we need to just throw away and get away with. But the room that we're making for is now virtues that are taking their place. It's verse 12. Put on, then, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. There's the, verse, there's the vices that we're, put, that we're putting to death, and in their place, virtues that replace them. Because when we let go of our sin, it is not simply the absence of sin in our lives. Now it's the room for the presence of Christ in our lives and his virtues and his attributes and his likeness that will take sin's place. We make room for virtue. Make room for the church I'll spend a little time on this one. In Colossians 3, verse 13, it says, Bearing with one another. Suddenly, this is not a you thing. Suddenly, everything that's just been shared by Paul is now something that you're doing with other people. And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. We who are in Christ belong together, not apart. We who are in Christ are unified because before him, we were separate. Before him, we were apart. But with him, we are now one body. Uh, Ephesians 4, 1 through 6, Paul says, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, I urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. There is one body, and one spirit, just as you were called to, the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Romans 15, 1 through 7. We who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak and to not please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good to build him up. For Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, that through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another, in accord with Christ Jesus, that together you may with one voice Glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. We are called to be together. We are called to support one another, to build one another up. This is one body. If you want to grow in Christ, but you want to grow apart from his body, you will only grow so far your growth will be stunted. How can you seek the light without those who are called the light of the world? 
How do you expect to see more than what is right in front of you if you continuously surround yourself in darkness and try arguing why the people of God are worth avoiding? There are times when I hear the person who argues, why can't I grow in my relationship away from the church and it just be Jesus and me? It's just Jesus and me, back and forth. When I go to work, Jesus is there. When I come home, Jesus is there. These are all true things. It's great, wonderful. I hope you're holding the door open when you're letting Jesus in at work with you. It's Jesus and you. Why, why do you hate his wife, though? Why do you hate the bride of Christ? I, I don't know if he appreciates that. I love hanging out with Jesus, but his wife sucks. Sorry. Church is awful. It becomes an issue there. I hear this argument, but there, there's two things that become clear. The first thing is that you will grow with Jesus when it's just you and Jesus, but you'll grow up until the point where you have the convicting call of obedience to be with his church. And then you will be faced with a choice, either to continue growing in obedience by going into the church or to continue living in disobedience and stop growing. You can grow with Jesus up until the church, and then you got to come and be a part of the church. The second is from 1 John chapter 2, verses 9 through 11. This one's a hard pill to swallow. Whoever says he is in the light and hates his brother is still in darkness. Whoever loves his brother abides in the light, and in him there is no cause for stumbling. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going, because the darkness has blinded his eyes. Uh, I want you to take a moment, and this is completely optional. There's no scorecard or quiz that will happen at the end of this to say, did you do the thing? Did you participate? If you would, close your eyes. Imagine walking into a vast and empty space. and There is no light at all, except that you happen to have brought a candle. There was some outside incredible force that decided, you'll need a candle for stepping into this dark world. And he hands it to you, and you light it. And it's lighting up your hands. You can see your feet. You can see a little, little spot of light that's just very warm, luminescent on the ground. And you can see that every time you take a step forward in that light, you're stepping into the light, and the light goes forward just a little bit more. You can see barely just what's around you, barely anything at all. And suddenly you happen to stumble upon a group of people, all who have candles, and their candles are burning together and they're burning brighter together. And suddenly now you're learning so much more about the darkness that surrounds you because you're seeing so much more light. You're seeing so much more things that are surrounding you. You're seeing them because you are with those who carry candles. You're with so many more people that have light. And with them, you've seen so much more. You've rapidly grown. You've rapidly learned. You've rapidly expanded your knowledge of the world surrounding you and expanded your knowledge of the vast darkness that surrounds you because now you have so much light. And then you decide that you didn't like the worship. And then you decide that one person really just got under your skin. And you walk away because you'd rather have just your light than let it shine before others or others' light shine before you and you seep back into darkness. You can open your eyes. Don't take my word for it. Matthew 5, verse 14, Jesus says, You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket but they put it on a stand and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Why would you choose not only to navigate the darkness alone, but to hide your light from others? We all need the church and we're all needed by the church. As messed up as it can be, we're called to forgive we're called to stir each other up in love and good works, Hebrews 10, 24. You need the church, and the church needs you. Third thing, make room for love. Colossians three fourteen. above all these things, put on love, 
which binds everything together in perfect harmony. If we're to seek unity in the church, we need to make room for love because we are known by our love for each other. In the Gospel of John, Jesus issues a new commandment in in chapter 13, verse 34. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you are also to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. It is an act of evangelism to love one another because loving other people tells people you know Jesus. Creating division in the church. Stirring conflict up with other Christians. Speaking poorly of other churches because you don't like the way they do things down the street. They're not the kinds of things that are recognizable as a disciple. It's even more than just the going to church on a Sunday morning and just participating in a sense. Loving the church is a command that we follow because loving the church shows people that we belong to it. You can go to church and not belong to it. You can go to church, call yourself a Christian, and not belong to Jesus. But when you belong to Jesus, you love the church, you love his people, and you love him most of all. And you are known by your love for each other. You're not known by your attendance. You're not known by how many, I'm not known by how many people sat in a chair. We're known by our love for one another and our love for Christ. We need that. If you tell people you go to church and then they see you throughout the week, do they know you as a follower of Christ or do they know you as someone who goes to church? But if you love people, would you pray for them when they're going through a hard time because they told their professor something really difficult? When they share something with you and you decide, I'm going to stop my life and pray over you and love on you. In those moments, do they know that you are a person who goes to church or do they know that you're someone who belongs to Jesus? I wonder, are Christians often recognized as disciples of Christ or instead disciples of whatever it is we're currently mad about? Put to death, anger, wrath, malice, slander, make room for forgiveness, love, make room for peace. Make room for peace. Colossians 3, verse 15. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Peace is something that we cannot be separated from. It cannot be separated from forgiveness. It cannot be separated from love. When we have something to forgive that's on our hearts, where we either let hatred win or we let love win and forgiveness flow out of our love for others. If we do not forgive, we do not love, we're at an impasse and peace becomes unattainable as we're constantly being eaten away by our anger and our need for justice by our own wrath. It's the moment where that person that makes you angry, you hear their name and suddenly you're angry, but they're not even in the room. (laughs) Joshua, who got mad? Who got mad? It's so interesting how a word has so much power over you. So much, it's so interesting how a name can change your entire state of mind. It's so interesting how someone who's in a room not even interacting with you can suddenly make you never want to step into that room ever again. Why? Why should we become slaves to our anger when we're already free from sin? When someone is the subject of your anger, they have a control over you that they don't even know that they have most of the time. (laughs) Peace is unattainable because we cannot separate it from forgiveness and love. It only becomes attainable when there is forgiveness and when there is love. Now, a lot of times we're apprehensive to forgive because if we think that we're going to forgive somebody, suddenly it means that whatever they did was okay. And we don't want, we don't want that kind of sense of false justice because that's not right. And it doesn't sit right with us. And, and let me be clear, forgiving someone is not giving their permission to have hurt you. Forgiving someone is acknowledging the fact that they did hurt you. You're forgiving them for it. And it's not making what they did suddenly okay to do. Forgiveness is not a letting go of justice. It's a giving to God the responsibility of justice. 
I forgive so that the responsibility of justice is no longer mine, but instead is in the hands of God because I know he will have justice served. I can't serve justice by being mad, but I can serve justice by forgiving because God is the one who will serve it. I know that justice will be served to the believer by Christ's death on the cross. I know that justice will be served to the unbeliever by separation from God and eternal torment. I know that God has justice, and I can give him the power to have justice. I don't need that. Choosing unforgiveness is a denial of God's justice and is therefore disobedience. And it's still hard, but it's necessary. It was hard to forgive my mom when she held me hostage for three days. It was hard to forgive her when I learned that Friday night spaghetti nights were not uh, spaghetti that was seasoned with very large peppercorns, but was instead seasoned with rat poison. It was hard to forgive a mom that wanted me dead. But I did. I learned to understand her pain, understand that she is made in the image of God and is valuable because God says so. And when I did that, my anger went away. I started picking up the phone when she called. I started telling her about a Jesus that I know. I started loving my mom again. I have a mom again because I forgave her. It can be difficult, but there is no peace apart from forgiveness and love. It's a quote from Thomas Merton where he says, we are not at peace with others because we are not at peace with ourselves. We're not at peace with ourselves because we're not at peace with God. When you choose to let God have justice, when you choose to let God handle it, then you'll choose forgiveness, you'll choose obedience, you'll have peace with God, you'll have peace with yourself, and you'll find peace with others, even the ones you have a hard time forgiving. Next is to make room for the word. Colossians 3.16, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Everything that we give life, we know is worthy of life because of the word of God. When I'm faced with a decision, are my answers measured against the word of God? I have an offer for a higher paying job, but I have to work when my church gathers. I'm starting to grow closer in a relationship with someone who happens to not be my wife. Should I just say I'm no longer interested in being married? Should I move on? I'm feeling alone and I'm convinced that I'm broken. Do I walk away? What do I do? We turn to the word of God for the answers. How are we to live who we are to live for. We turn to the word of God, and the more that we turn to the word of God, the more that it moves in our lives, the more that the lies and the false teachings of this world move out of our lives. Let the word of God dwell in us richly, and we are to teach and admonish others. It's not just a, a me thing. That's an all of us thing. The more that the word dwells in us, the easier it becomes to teach and admonish others. It's the moment when someone comes up to you for advice, and your advice is not just coming from your brain, it's coming from the word of God, because the word of God is constantly on your mind. The word of God is what equips us to do this. The more that it's rooted in our lives, the more difficult it is for us to be foolish. When you're struggling with self-esteem or body image, when you're struggling with who you are, struggling with pain or sorrow or depression, anger, addiction, with sin, with loneliness, with family issues, anything under the sun, when you turn to God and you find comfort in his word, it will be your guide. Proverbs 3, verse 5 and 6, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make straight your paths. God's word will lead you where you need to be, not only to deeper understanding, but also to the right actions. It's not just about finding quick solutions. We don't just open up our Bibles and go, this is the solution. But when we live in our Bible, when we live in the word, then the solutions become clear, not because of what we're reading today, but because what we've been reading for the past year. When the word is dwelling in our hearts, our hearts dwell with God, our hearts are fixated on God, our hearts are fixated on Christ, and therefore our actions follow. 
If you're depressed, you go to therapy. That's a quick solution, and I agree with it. I agree with the statement. But the kind of therapy you need and the values that you look for in a therapist are things that you can find described in Scripture. Finding the right person to counsel you is kind of important. Even the advice that's given to you can be weighed against Scripture. The more that this word takes root in your heart, the more wisdom you'll have in your tool belt to not only know what words to trust, what words to let pass by, but also how to respond to each. You can have a loving friend give you awful advice, and I'm sure we've all been there. Don't point to the person next to you. <laughs> Remember, speech. <laughs> you can also have a hateful enemy give you the odd nugget of wisdom. God's word not only will help you decipher them, but it will help you know when to be bold and when to be humble. The last point is this. Make room for Christ. Colossians 3.17, And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. This is the goal. We fixate our mind, our heart, our thoughts, our theology, our everything, our treasures in heaven and on Christ. When we run this race of life, we run it because it is empowered by Jesus. We run it because Jesus is the one who sets the start, because Jesus is the one who sets up the race, and we run it because Jesus is the finish line. This is why we put to death our old selves and why we make room for the new self, because our greatest hope is Christ. I look within no longer to find myself, but to find Christ alive in me. Because if he lives in me, I am alive. I know we've gone through a lot of scripture. One more. Luke 24, verse 5. And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? Jesus is not among the dead. If Jesus is in you, you are not dead. You are alive. Let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for the truth that is found in you and only in you. The truth that is your word. The truth that is your encouragement. The truth that is your spirit alive in us. Jesus, we ask that with boldness and with courage, we, we step out in faith and we focus our eyes, our minds, our hearts, our everything on you. That we live this life in reflection to you and for you. Allow our actions to be a flowing out from our heart that is already yours. Lord, equip us to love others, to forgive, to be connected in the church. Love this church. Love you above all. And remind us day in and day out that when we look within and see you, we are alive because it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Jesus, we pray this in your wonderful and your precious name. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you, cause his face to shine upon you, and in all his ways give you peace forever and ever. Amen. <laughs>